When I sold our previous boat, the tender and small petrol outboard went with it and I vowed I would not own a petrol outboard again. I was sold on the idea of an electric outboard the first time I rode in a tender with one of these motors. Easy to start, almost silent in operation, no fumes, no petrol or oil to leak when stored in a locker, no flammable fuel to store, separates into two parts for easy handing up on board and practically no requirement to service. However, the high purchase price put me off buying an electric outboard until this season when we have already had a few situations where strong tide and or strong winds made rowing our tender impractical. I decided to bite the bullet and get an electric outboard as I can see that it would open up new options when we're anchored or moored during our coming cruise this summer. I narrowed the choice down to two options, the Torquedo Travel 903 or the e-Propulsion Spirit 1.0 Plus. These are products from companies with a track record in this area and a reputation for well-made and reliable products. An electric outboard costs about three times as much as a petrol outboard of similar power, so I'm expecting the electric outboard to last me a long time. I found it hard to decide between the two motors, so these are the criteria I use to choose between them. I'm not sponsored here, so it's my own cash I'm parting with. I got the data from the manufacturers and I realised that a pinch of salt may be required when comparing the figures. The factors I gave weight to were price, power output, mass, battery capacity, range, features, warranty and origin. First, price. At the time of making this video, they're both pretty much identical in price. I looked at various retailers to get the best price and included the cost of a 12 volt charger. Both were supplied with free carry bags, a very welcome accessory. Next, power. They're pretty similar with the e-propulsion unit having slightly more power, £71 claimed versus £60 for the Torquedo, with the two motors apparently being equivalent to a 3 horsepower and a 2.5 horsepower petrol outboard respectively. In terms of weight, the Torquedo is lighter at 17.3 kilos and the e-propulsion two bags of sugar heavier at 19.3 kilos. Both seem easy to lift compared to a petrol outboard as the battery is easily detached from the motor. What about the battery pack? The Torquedo unit has a capacity of 915 watt hours, whereas the e-propulsion has quite a bit more oomph with 1276 watt hours usable. In terms of range, Torquedo say that their motor will manage 2.3 hours at 3.6 miles per hour for a range of eight miles, whereas e-propulsion claim 5 hours at 4.5 miles per hour, providing a range of 22 miles. These figures are likely optimistic and depend heavily on the water conditions, size of tender and loading, but it seems clear that e-propulsion packs quite a bit more punch in this department. Both engines have good endurance at low and moderate speed, but experience tells me that full power will often be needed in choppy waters and against the wind. Considering other features of the two motors, the Torquedo has a good display containing a GPS so it can give a real-time indication of range, whereas the e-propulsion display is much simpler. Both units are waterproof, but the e-propulsion battery will float, which I thought was a great safety feature if accidentally dropped, for example when handing up from the tender into the boat. The e-propulsion also comes with anodes fitted as standard, whereas the Torquedo offers these as an optional accessory. I thought the 12 volt charging arrangement for the e-propulsion was particularly good. The 12 volt charger allows connection to a standard 12 volt socket, but is also a charge controller allowing direct connection to a solar panel. A warranty is a good indication of the confidence a manufacturer has in their product. Torquedo offers a 5 year warranty on their motor, whereas e-propulsion only 3. Finally, I considered the country of origin. Torquedo is a well-established German firm and seems to have a good reputation for after-sales support, whereas e-propulsion is a Chinese firm and I've heard one or two less favourable stories of their support. To help me make my decision, I gave scores to each of these factors. No points for price, as they're neck and neck. For power, I awarded a point to e-propulsion, but gave Torquedo a point for lighter weight. The extra range and higher battery capacity were worth a point each for the e-propulsion. I gave Torquedo a point for its GPS display and two points to e-propulsion for its floating battery, anodes and 12 volt charging arrangements. The Torquedo gained two more points for its longer warranty and its European origin. 
Totalling up the scores, the e-propulsion was the winner for me, but others may disagree depending on their use case. I've certainly seen plenty of both of these models on the water. I want to be able to charge the outboard battery without using shore power, so I felt that I needed a solar source. There's not enough room on Molly's deck for much in the way of a solar panel, so I chose a folding solar panel. I can charge the e-propulsion's outboard direct from the solar panel or from the 12 volt socket, and I decided it would be good to top up the house battery too when needed. I sourced some sturdy Freeman deck plugs so I can connect the panel when needed, and I also bought a solar charge controller to pass the current to the leisure and starter batteries. First impressions of the e-propulsion motor were good. It feels very sturdy and well made. It was easy to assemble the motor and mount it onto the dinghy transom, but I'll put a safety line in a carabiner in case I drop it. It's quite easy to operate and feels very nippy on flat water. I went out into the main channel where there was a small chop and quite a strong breeze. Uh, it made good headway in these conditions with just me in my 2.8 metre dinghy, but needed full power. I covered about two miles in half an hour, so average four knots, and in that time I used about 15% of the battery. So the 20 mile range will only be obtainable on flat water out of the breeze. That's fair enough, as I wouldn't want to bash very far in choppy conditions, but envisage using my dinghy to explore the shallow parts of anchorages. Let's have a look at how I installed a charge controller so that I can use the solar panel to charge the house batteries too. Well, here I am in the starboard locker, having emptied it all out again, climbed right in. It's quite a cosy fit. That's the GPS antenna there. Looking forward, and then if I look up, that is the power connection for the water helm and also the holes I've just made for the solar panel cables. I think I can climb out now. So I brought the cables round into the battery compartment, fed them round and here they are ready to be connected. We've got the wooden bracket which has been sicker flex on because that surface is a bit uneven and I've rebated that um, piece of wood, an old piece of teak. Um, so that there's an air, air gap so that hopefully the heat sink will allow ventilation. So I've left a bit of space above and um, that teak came from a laboratory desk from school that I worked in for 20 years. They were going to uh, throw away some of those desks in science labs so it's very nice to be able to repurpose it. I've got to cut some cables now to connect from where the charge controller is going to be round to the um, positive and negative terminals of the leisure batteries. I'm going to connect to the shunt here, which means that my battery monitor will be able to sense the current that's being put into the batteries. And of course, the other one will go to the, to the live. I've cut some of the the six millimeter square cable that I've used for the wiring, which I've purposely oversized for the size of panel I'm gonna to use to try and reduce the, uh, the voltage drop as much as possible. Got the supply leads connected to, to the plugs there, and I send them up and along the boom to the solar panel. Here we are all connected up and I can see from the charge controller that uh, we've got charge going in. We've got a quick burst of sun here right now and I can see we've got the charge voltage going up to 4 amps, all over 4 amps, that's lovely. Um, the connection to the starter battery is via this 3 amp fuse here. The maximum current it's expecting to deliver is one amp. Um, 
So three amp fuse was the smallest one I had. Um, I've got a connection uh, to the negative on the shunt. Um, I don't need a connection from the negative of the starter battery to the charge controller. The positive lead is connected to the positive lead of the leisure battery. It's not fused at the moment. Um, I just wanted to see how things went before that. Um, at some point I'll probably need to put a, a fuse here close to the um, close to the battery just for safety although uh, I'm sure the charge controller likely uh, cut out before uh, uh, that was a problem although it's recommended so we'll, we'll probably do that later on so yeah quite pleased with that